In this section of notes, we're going to be, uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at defining urbanism and some of the key concepts. And then we're going to begin the systems of the cities. However, um, there's a lot of stuff involved in this in these sections of notes. So they may be closer to 15 minutes. I apologize. Um, but th that's all we can do. We, we've got to get through them. Um, today, though, what I want you to focus on first in, in the first section of notes, we're really going to be looking at the key concepts. <laughs> Uh, try to come up with a way to kind of identify what these mean and knowing what they mean uh, it would be essential. Um, as well as once we start actually looking at cities and systems of cities, kind of get a mental image of what the types of cities we talk about look like. Defining urbanism. We're going to look at a lot of different key concepts here, um, just like we normally do to introduce the unit, uh, so that we can apply them later. Number one, key definitions. Nucleated is when one or more clear core areas and the people who live in there work in non-agricultural jobs. That's what nucleated means. Many core areas and not very many agricultural jobs. Towns are smaller and less complex than cities, but they still have nuclear business concentrations. Cities are usually surrounded by suburbs areas that are also nucleated but use much land space for residents of people that work in or near cities. The physical city then is a continuous development that contains a central city and many nearby cities, towns, and suburbs. Physical cities may be separated by less developed landscapes but they may still be part of a larger metropolitan area which is a large-scale functional entity that operates as an integrated economic whole. Number two, urban hierarchy. Clustered settlements range in size from hamlets to megalopolises, and they may be arranged in, an hi in a hierarchy according to the complexity of their centralizing functions. I've got a visual here, and I've edited it to fit our curriculum the best as possible, uh, but here goes nothing. Um, on this model, at the bottom, there is an isolated dwelling zone. In our curriculum, we're not really worried about this isolated dwelling zone. We don't really have those around, so I'm going to kind of color them in with the closest red color that I have, even though it doesn't fit very well. There we go. So now, at the bottom, we have a hamlet. The hamlet is small clusters of farmers' houses. In the hamlet, you have few basic services. You might have a gas station, might have a general store, might have a post office. Then that would be it. Then up from that, we have village. Village offers several dozen services. Stores sell only certain goods. Gas stations may sell competing brands of gas. Then we move up into towns. In this visual, we have a large town and a small town. For our purposes of the curriculum, we're just looking at towns themselves. Towns are larger and more specialized structures. They have banks, post offices, hospitals, and schools. They also have a zone, which I've added here, known as a hinterland. A hinterland is a surrounding area of smaller villages and hamlets economically dependent on it. So it's got kind of, sort of, its own suburb, even though I don't want you to start getting that wordage confused. Then we move up into a city. A city has a larger population, more functional specializations. It has larger hinterlands and a greater centrality. Also within the city, and you can see where I've added that, you have a central business district. We're going to be talking a lot about the central business district in this section of notes, but the central business di district, and sometimes you'll see it, the acronym CBD, is where retail stores, business offices, and cultural activities are concentrated in one area. And then we move up. In this graph, it shows a conurbation. For our purposes, I just want you to refer to this zone as a megalopolis. There's multiple cities that have grown together. 
An example in the United States in the Northeast, because that's where you're going to have the megalopolis, is Bosniwash. This is Boston to Washington, D.C. Social characteristics of urban areas. There was a, in the 1930s, there was a social scientist by the name of Louis Wirth. He defined a city as a permanent settlement with three characteristics. Number one, he said that they had a large size. Residents, resident knows how only small per, the resident knows only a small percentage of the people. Social contacts reflect work, living arrangements, and daily routines. Characteristic number one. Characteristic number two, cities have a high density, highly specialized jobs. Each per person has a special task uh, that allows the urban system to run smoothly. A special task or role that allows the urban system to run smoothly. This also creates competition and also creates a rich people and a poor people because of it. And then the last one, cities have a social heterogeneity, meaning diversity. There's more anonymity than rural areas. Cultures in cities, the cultures that were unacceptable in the rural scene, flocked to the cities because of the diversity and because you could kind of live anonymously in a sense. Now moving on to systems of cities. First thing I want to look at is the origin and evolution of cities. During the Neolithic Revolution, permanent settlements were established, but they remained small and they were relatively simple. Job specialization began when not everyone had to farm. And government buildings started to appear and villages started to diversify. So it was kind of after the Neolithic Revolution that we first have the development of specific cities. First thing I want to look at in this origin and evolution of cities is the role of government. The period between 4000 and 2000 BCE is called the formative era for both the development of states and urbanization. The rise of the earliest states is closely linked to the evolution of the first cities. As farming techniques improved and trade up and down the rivers developed, cities started to evolve. I got a picture in the top left corner that I thought uh, was pretty cool. Um, it's showing you evolution um, with a scientific way and then on the faces it's putting cities. That's a good mental image to kind of put into your head. Function and location of ancient cities. The ancient city was the organizational focus of the state. Agriculture had to be planned and controlled to guarantee food, so there was a need for a government. Governments collected taxes and built fortified walls. Cities were located near productive farmlands and along rivers. Sites within cities and the sites of the cities themselves were chosen for their defensibility. A group of urban elite, also known as decision makers and organizers, controlled the resources and sometimes controlled the lives of the people within the city. Functions of ancient cities included four different things. Number one, centers of power. The cities were the headquarters of the state. Number two, religious centers. Priests live here. Number three, economic centers. There were markets for trade available in the cities. And number four, educational centers. This was where teachers and, in the ancient times, philosophers were located. One thing I want to point out, the largest ancient cities only got to be about 10,000 to 15,000 people inhabiting it because the infrastructure was not developed to a point where they could support more than that many people. Early urbanization around the Mediterranean. Settlements were first established around the eastern Mediterranean Sea about 2,500 years ago by the forerunners of ancient Greece. They were organized into what was known as city-states or self-governing communities that included the nearby countryside. The city-states provided government military protection, and public services. Urban settlements grew in the Mediterranean area during the 8th and 9th centuries. 
Greek settlement spread as far west as Spain. The Phoenicians, which our modern-day alphabet comes from, established communities on the southwestern coastline of Africa. Athens was the first city, city-state in this case, to reach 10,000 people. The Roman Empire, by the 5th and the 4th century BC, had cities, or had the city of Rome with a population of over 250,000 people. They also had a network of land and sea routes. Here's some good visuals of what these ancient city-states might have looked like with the fortified walls and the surrounding countryside. And then the bottom right, a good example of the city-state of Athens, of, of Greece. Now I want to point out the urban growth in China because I don't want to forget about the East Asian urbanization. Earliest civilizations in East Asia grew around the Huang He River and its tributaries. The Silk Road, this major trade and transportation route flourished this area. It made Eastern Asia and China become strong centers of trade. The Grand Canal was built connecting the Yellow and the Yangtze River, and that also made the region flourish. So we had some urbanization going on and urban growth going on in China during the same time period as the Greeks and Romans. We just don't hear about it as much because they weren't as large. Now I want to look at medieval pre-industrial and industrial world cities. After the fall of the Western Empire, Roman Empire in 476 CE or AD, urban settlements declined across Europe and the Mediterranean area. Urban life revived during the 11th century, stimulated by trade that developed between Italian cities of Venice and Genoa in the Middle East because of the Crusades. Most medieval European cities were surrounded by fortified walls. They had narrow and winding streets. There were occupational groups clustered together in distinct sections, such as bakers, carpenters, and metal workers. And ethnicity also defined communities as residents sought to keep people out who differed from them. The term ghetto first described the segregation of Jews in Venice. Today, ghetto is referring to grouping and ethnicity in a certain part of the city, a lot of times a substandard part of that city. Cities in the pre-industrial world often became urban centers for a whole cultural region. Geographer Mark Jefferson named these primate cities. These are larger than other cities in the area, and they represent the national culture. Kyoto is an example in Japan. Paris is an example in France. London is an example in Europe. So you can see these through these different graphs here, and how the size of that one city is not only a cultural representation of the whole country as a whole, but also is the largest city by far in that region. By the 16th century, significant trade routes connected the western and eastern hemispheres via the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. These networks stimulated the growth of the mercantile city, where trade became central to city design. What this looked like was you had a central square that was fronted by government and religious buildings as well as housing for the rich. Infrastructure, or streets, leading to the central square were arteries. They were lined with shops. Good examples of this is like Lisbon, Amsterdam, and London. A lot of the European cities that you see around today are developed as kind of mercantile cities. The Industrial Revolution created the manufacturing city where factories attracted laborers from rural areas and other countries to tenements constructed to provide housing for factory workers. You have older, winding, narrow streets that gave way to straight and wide streets for commercial traffic. The older, winding, narrow streets are what you would see in the mercantile city. Developers divided the manufacturing city into regular-sized lots, and you can see that in these pictures here. Some of these cities retained a historical town square. Others lost that organization. 
Most suffered from sanitation, overcrowding, and pollution because of rapid urbanization.